Hey, we are back here live on PALS TV, everyone. Thank you for coming back and joining us. As you all know, we love education here at PALS. Um, it's very important to me and making sure that it's a part of all of our programs. And we've been very fortunate to have uh, Ed Cromley come on each week and give us different history lessons with the Revolutionary War and really some things that hit close to home around our area. So we're very grateful for Ed to spend his time here and, and giving us such wonderful information and very valuable during this time. Um, so we can't thank you enough, Ed, for coming on and we'll be heading live from our Gallia County program. Hello, uh, good morning to you on this fine Tuesday. And uh, I have in the screen here for you to see my brown bass firelock. It's a musket and it's laying here on the table. And I want to talk about some words, not firepower, but words that we use today even that come from this weapon and some other things that the colonial uh, people did and talked about. Uh, this gun is made up of three parts. And the first part is this metallic part that I'm zooming in on. It's called the lock of the gun. It's got some different parts on it, but all this metal right here is the lock. And I'll back up here and you can see the wooden part that starts uh, at, the, at the back of the gun where you will put the shoulder against yourself. And then it goes clear up here to the other edge. All this wood clear up there is called the stock. So we've got the lock and the stock. And then we have the business part of it, the barrel, and that's the metal part here that's on top of the wood. And of course, that's where uh, the musket balls come out. And the entirety of the gun then is the lock and the stock. and the barrel. And this phrase is used uh, even today when people buy and sell. If you want to buy an entire item, uh, for example, a property where you want uh, all the buildings on it and anything else that is there, you say that I want this lock, stock, and barrel. So from this gun, uh, in the 1700s, this gun was used, and uh, even from this gun, uh, all this many years later, that phrase is used to mean every part of something. Now, also with this gun, this brown bess, we have uh, some other phrases, and one of them is called a flash in the pan. And I want to zero in here on what the, is the pan, and it's the part that's right here. And right in there, there's an indentation. See how my finger's going down in there? And that pan is where you put a little bit of gunpowder that will catch on fire and will send the fire through a hole that's located here at the end of the toothpick. There. There's a hole there, see how the toothpick goes in. That fire goes in and makes a larger amount of gunpowder explode and propel the musket ball out of the weapon. Well, sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes all that happens is that right in here, that gunpowder just flashes real quick, does not send anything down into the musket barrel and you don't fire. It's called a misfire as a matter of fact. But anyway, this activity, when it doesn't do correctly, is called a flash in the pan. So you have a flash of fire in the pan. Now, sometimes you might hear this word, the phrase, flash in the pan. It means that somebody that starts out really good, like they're going to do everything they're supposed to do, and then they don't do it. So they are called a flash in the pan. Athletes sometimes are called flash in the pans. They might be a basketball player scoring 30 points the first couple games of the season, and then they might score two or three in games that follow. That would be a flash in the pan. 
or it could be a politician, a politician that might say, I'm going to get all these laws passed. And they go to their house of, of making laws, their Congress, and they get a law or two passed, and then they don't do anything the rest of the time they're there, a flash in the pan. And so again, that comes from that uh, 17th, uh, 1700s, the 18th century weapons that were used. Uh, there is another um, phrase that deals with this gun, and this hammer, and we'll have some trouble pulling it back. Well, let's show it to you. First of all, there's the position of it right now. It had been fired. The uh, lock is clear forward. Takes two hands uh, to pull that back. And now you can see it's back a little bit further. This is a position called half cock. It's a safety position with your frism covered where your, your um, gunpowder is. And if I pull the trigger of this gun, nothing happens, just like the safety of uh, the modern day guns, guns that we have. If this goes off right now, uh, that would be, I was not prepared for it to go off because it should have gone to full cock before it would work. And I'll try to pull it all the way back there. I could do that with one hand. Pulling it back all the way, then I know that it will go off when I pull the trigger. But at half cock, I expect it not to. If that gun goes off half cocked, something bad's going to happen. Uh, somebody could get hurt. Uh, it, not being against my shoulder maybe could hurt me. Uh, something uh, is bad wrong. Now I pulled the trigger earlier and nothing happened. And watch closely. I'm going to pull the trigger now. It's at full cock. It should go off. There is no powder, so there will be no fire or anything. But look for sparks when the flint hits the metal steel frism. And those are the sparks that light up the gunpowder that's in the pan and starts the process of firing the gun. Well, the phrase that we hear sometimes is going off half cocked. And if someone would go off half cocked, what do those words mean today? They mean that somebody was really not prepared to do what they started to do. And um, it would be a surprise as what would occur then. And also it would be something that wouldn't be very good. So if the safety for this particular weapon wasn't working, the half cock position and the gun would go off, then something bad would happen. A lot of recoil or maybe the ball that fires out would hit something you didn't intend it to do. So those are some things about the um, 18th century weapons that come to us today. Now I want to show you a close-up of the flint. The flint that makes the spark when it hits the metal that lights the gunpowder that starts the process of firing this weapon. And you'll see that this flint has a sharpened end over this direction. Uh, this is the part that goes in the back, and this strikes the metal. Now, if someone was trying to be very conservative uh, with their money, they would, when this gets dull, they would do what's called nap the flint. Uh, in those days, it was called, they would skin the flint to make it sharp again, like sharpening a knife. And if someone did that a lot, they were cheap and they were called a skin flint. So if you hear the word skin flint, it's somebody that's trying to get the use out of something, uh, get its entire use, and really kind of be cheap in the way that you uh, operate your life. If I could move on over here and show you, oops, gotta get, get in. This material here, that's not a bunch of ants, that is gunpowder. And we had a phrase there, 
that is used occasionally. I don't hear it very often, but it would be a phrase of keep your powder dry. And of course, if gunpowder gets wet, it is not uh, very flammable. And so it's very important if you were going to battle that you kept your that you kept your gunpowder dry and that you were ready to fight at all times. And so to be prepared, uh, the idiom that's used there is keep your powder dry. Now, not only did they fire guns, they also had cannons. And cannons were fired from a uh, fuse that you put down into the cannon uh, that would take the fire down in there to, to make it go off. Uh, if you wanted the cannon to fire very, very quickly, then you used a short fuse. If you wanted it to take a while, you'd use a longer fuse. So if someone gets excited or they get mad very quickly, they work on a short fuse. Uh, people that would hunt, and uh, this still happens today, but people that would hunt, when they harvested uh, the animals they were after, they would put them inside of a bag to carry them as they go on looking for more of the animal that they would like to get uh, for dinner. Uh, and we have the phrase that uh, is used quite often that I hear, it's in the bag. Well, if the animal is in the bag, you have uh, harvested it and you are ready to take it home. So you have accomplished what you were going to do. So it's in the bag comes from that. Uh, if we go on over here, try not to make people dizzy. I have a knife laying here. and I do not have a grindstone. But what I'd like to point out is that people would sharpen their knives with a grinding wheel that would be off to the side of a table, it would be connected to the table, and people would put their face right down on the uh, table to look to see if the item had gotten sharpened. So if I could do this, maybe you see me. They would put their nose right next to the grindstone as they looked down to see if the item was sharp, sharpened, or if it needed more work. Well, the person that was doing that to sharpen the knife was keeping their nose to the grindstone. So when we talk about keeping the nose to the grindstone, we are talking about somebody that is really intently working and of course, that's a good quality to have, to keep your nose to the grindstone. I have here some clothes. These are pretty nice clothes that I have. And uh, this is a, a suit, it's really a tuxedo. And uh, whenever clothes are made out of the same material, it takes a certain amount. And they found in colonial times, the clothing that they wore, if you got an entire set of clothing, it took nine yards of cloth. And so we have a phrase now say that says, use the whole nine yards. And so if you were using the whole nine yards, what it means is that you were using everything it took to make a complete set. Now, later on, that whole nine yards was meant to, uh, in World War II, they had machine guns that had a ribbon of bullets that would work through the machine guns. And those uh, guns, the, the bullets, were stuck together and a complete set of that was also 27 feet long or nine yards. And so in World War II, if you gave them the whole nine yards, what it meant was that you unloaded the entire um, number of bullets that you had on your opponent, on your enemy.
Also, these clothes look pretty good. I, I'm kind of happy with them. Uh, the collars match. And the best way to make sure that collars match is that you use all the same cloth. And we talk about people that are alike and we say they're cut from the same cloth. And again, it comes from the idea that if you want the cloth to be the same, if you want uh, the, the jacket to match the pants, then they have to come from the same bolt of cloth that you're using there. So cut from the same cloth means that uh, people are the same and uh, are alike in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, back to the guns, we're talking about uh, soldiers. And there's a phrase that says, face the music. And uh, if you've ever gotten in trouble with someone and they have you come to them and, and you have to own up to what you've done, it's called face the music. And this comes from, again, the colonial period. If there was a soldier who was disobedient and they had to throw them out of the army to give them a dishonorable discharge, they would have them appear in front of the troops and they would play music on a drum and they would uh, dismiss the person from service and they would uh, play drums or make music as the person uh, answered for their, um, for their indiscretion or for their uh, lack of being uh, appropriate in the army. So that's face of music. And I've heard this also as a, a term um, that you would be drummed out of the service. And of course the music that they made uh, in the service was drumming. Um, I've got a stick here, if I could locate the camera and I'll back it up a little bit. Do you see the notches on the stick? Okay. And there's three of them. And then there's one that is made a little bit, but is not completely moved out. And what I want to talk about is what bankers used to do uh, back in the day in the colonial times. If they loaned you money, uh, every period of time that they would add interest to your loan, they would make notches in a stick. And that would be your stick. And you would try to get to the um, banker, to the lender, before he made another notch. Now, another word for notch would be a nick. And sometimes, and I'm going to try to, oops, it fell out already, make another notch, and then you would owe more money. You would owe more interest as the time had passed. Well, you would try to get there before they made the next nick. And so if you get someplace just before something bad happens, it's called that you get there in the nick of time. And so they're trying to get there before that last nick that happened to fall out on me is made and more interest is charged. So that was another thing that happened in colonial times, the nicks that go on. Okay, uh, let's talk about some bad things that happened in colonial times. First of all, not necessarily bad, but, um, Give you a different view of the gun there while I'm talking about uh, some robbers. And uh, robbers would take advantage of a custom that was in the colonial era of wearing powdered wigs. And um, they would find someone wearing a powder wig. The common man didn't do that. The person with not very much money didn't wear a wig. And so if you were walking down the street and you had a wig on, uh, it was somebody that probably you would gain a good bit of money from if you robbed them. And so they would grab a hold of the wig and pull it down over top of the person they were robbing's eyes. Well, the wigs were made out of wool. 
And so if you want to trick somebody or put them at an, a disadvantage, uh, the phrase is pull the wool over the eyes. So these would do that and they would pull those wigs over their eyes and while the person was trying to regain sight, they would rob them. Now the intelligent thief would not only go after anybody that had a wig, but they would go over people that had an extravagant or a big wig. So bosses are now uh, are called, or people that have a lot of influence in society or have a lot of money, they are called big wigs because that was what indicated wealth back in colonial times for those who chose to wear wigs. Of course, George Washington is shown wearing a wig and uh, Benjamin Franklin, a lot of times you see him bald, but uh, there's some times that you might see him with a wig on with other people. So uh, the big wig uh, happens like that. Now, I'd like to talk more about the headwear and show you a hat that I was wearing today. And I would show you, hopefully, we'll move over here. If there was a race to be started, now sometimes in track they would they would shoot a gun. Uh, sometimes when you start uh, other athletic events, there's a whistle blown, something of that nature. Back in colonial times, to start a race, they would drop a hat. And so the phrase comes to us of at a drop of a hat. I just can't keep up with it. And so the starter would be wearing a hat. He'd raise his hat. And when he dropped it, then the race would start. Well, what does at a drop of a hat mean? It means that you're ready immediately. If you're going to do well in a race, then you need to be ready to run at the very beginning of the race and not be standing around not prepared. And so people who are ready at a drop of a hat are ready immediately to start the activity. Uh, talking about running, a phrase that's used a lot of times is being run through the mill. And if you think about uh, what happened uh, with grain that was taken through a mill, it was mashed and torn up and uh, really beaten up. And um, so if you are run through the mill, you are treated uh, not very nicely and you suffer from the treatment. And I've got another one here. And hopefully I can get myself in the picture. I'm supposed to have a cameraman next week. It's kind of difficult without it. Uh, whenever you would meet someone in colonial times that you wanted to show respect to, you would uh, bow to them. And what you would do is you would put a foot forward and then you would bow. And there's a couple things that would be going on in colonial times. One would be that maybe one uh, leg was hurt and the other wasn't. Uh, maybe you had a, a pair of shoes, but one shoe was nicer looking than the other. You would put that best leg, that best shoe forward as you did your bowing. Uh, my knee over here, it doesn't do as well, so I would have more trouble bowing this way as opposed to this way. So this would be my best foot, foot forward. And so whenever we want to try to impress other people, then we want to try to put our best foot forward as we make uh, them see us for the best thing that we uh, could present. Well, my cap here, my hat has an adornment to it. It has a feather. And why would I have a feather in my hat? The Yankee Doodle Dandy song talks about 
putting a feather in your cap. But why was really feathers, why were they used in hats? And the reason that you could wear a feather in a hat as a colonial soldier was that in battle, you actually killed one of the uh, British. And uh, of course, they didn't have a lot of material things uh, in the, in the uh, military, uh, out in the wilderness as they were fighting. And so there were feathers to be found from birds. And so you could signify your importance in battle by putting a feather in your cap. So uh, in the colonial army, a feather in the cap would signify success. And so if you have something that you've done successfully, then you would today say that you could put a feather in your cap. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, sleeping. Hopefully you had a good night's sleep last night, but there are some phrases uh, that people might say to you as you go to bed. They might say, sleep tight. Oh, wow, what's, what's sleep tight mean? Sleep tight goes back to colonial times when the beds, the box springs, so to speak, of your bedding was um, made out of ropes. And if the ropes loosened up, then you had a saggy bed and it wasn't very comfortable. So you would want to tighten the ropes so that it was more comfortable to sleep in. And so that's where the phrase sleep tight comes in. A comfortable sleep for you, sleeping tight. Uh, they might say, or you might say, I'm going to bed, or you could say, I'm going to hit the hay. And again, I don't think uh, many of us have hit the hay when we went to bed. But the mattresses, not the box springs, but the mattresses in colonial times were uh, material that was filled with straw and hay and leaves so that it would be softer uh, to lay on uh, than, of course, the box springs or the ropes. But the ropes hold up, held up the mattress, which was full of hay and other uh, vegetation. Which brings us to the next phrase that you might hear, don't let the bed bugs bite. And bed bugs are not a very pleasant thing. We have them today. Sometimes uh, homes get infested with bed bugs. But uh, it was really a problem in that time because the bed bugs were really enjoyed living in the foliage that was in your mattress. And uh, of course they wanted to come out and bite you to get some of uh, your flesh and blood uh, for their nutrition. Now, another thing that encouraged the bed bugs was that the colonial people probably took a bath every three months or so. And so they were not the cleanest uh, people and uh, they allowed, uh, they were just a good site for the bed bugs to feast. And uh, so if they tell you sleep tight, you know what that means now that uh, you want a comfortable night's sleep, Hit the hay means the, that you're going to lay down on your mattress and don't let the bed bugs bite. Uh, don't uh, let uh, anything bother you in the night. Now, uh, another phrase that we see, and I've seen this on commercials on television, is bring home the bacon. And what would bring home the bacon mean? I mean, you know, it's not a great big deal. We have a lot of food uh, in our society, but bringing home the bacon in colonial times meant that uh, you were uh, industrious enough to bring meat home to be eaten. And uh, if you uh, could have meat for your family, then you were pretty, um, pretty well off and uh, you were able to provide for them nicely. So bringing home the bacon again. Uh, everybody enjoys bacon. It seems like it's getting a, a great name. Uh, put, if you add bacon to any type of food, it makes it better. And um, a lot of different uh, advertisements are talking about bacon a lot. Uh, if you go to uh, Captain D's particularly, you will be asked if you want hush puppies. Well, why in the world was a food called hush puppies? Well, in colonial times, 
uh, the dogs were allowed in the house all the time. And with everybody sitting down to eat, uh, they would start barking. And that was not very nice. And so to shut the dogs up, I guess we can say shut up since we're talking about a dog and not some other person. Uh, you would say, uh, have these bits of bread that was uh, fried and you would throw it under the table. And instead of barking, the dog would be eating something. And so that would hush the dog or hush puppies. And that's why those uh, foods are called that. But uh, today I think they put a little more taste to them and they are enjoyable for humans to eat too. Now, I wanna take you to a dining room because in colonial times, people would go and they would eat at the dining room. This would be especially people who were affluent, people that had a lot of uh, possessions and money, a large family maybe, and they would all sit at a table and they would eat and they would uh, they might have an appetizer and they would have meat and, and vegetables uh, because they were wealthy. Uh, common man may not have all that. They may just have some type of a soup to eat uh, uh, that had a vegetable in it uh, to give flavor to the water. But the very wealthy people would eat uh, in uh, a room. And after they got done with the main course, they would leave the room and they would go to another room. Now this room is co commonly called a parlor. Uh, my grandparents had a parlor. Uh, we have a little setting room here that might uh, be serving as a parlor if we were doing this. And when we went to the parlor, there would be some sweets, a cake, pie, uh, maybe some candy that was made at home. But anyway, you would go in there and you would sit down in the parlor and you would have sweets. Well. You left one room and went to another. And whenever you leave something, it's called you desert it. And so that's how we came up with the word dessert because we desert the dining room and we end up at the parlor and we have that food that we commonly call dessert. So that's where that phrase, there, that word comes from dessert. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit more about food in a way. Um, they believed in colonial times that if you had cows in a barn and you were going to milk them, that if there was a goat that stayed in the barn with the cows, the cows would give more milk. And if you wanted to make uh, the cows give less milk, and you would probably do this to a competitor or maybe just as a prank to a neighbor, you would go and you would get their goat and take it out of the barn and the cows would give less milk. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what everybody thought. Well, the phrase getting your goat or somebody uh, making you uh, feel less comfortable or at ease or be, being able to do less that uh, you were thinking about doing would be called getting your goat. Um, another phrase uh, that comes from us uh, to us from the colonial times is keep your shirt on. And typically in colonial times, if it was time to fight, you took your shirt off as the first thing. So if somebody's starting to get angry and they want to fight, and hopefully it's just an argument, it's not a fist fight or something of that nature, uh, we say, keep your shirt on. Uh, we don't want to fight is what that means. Um, I'd like to talk to you about another word called a spinster. And a spinster comes to us. Uh, typically you talk about someone who is not married uh, being a spinster. It's uh, not a very nice term but it comes from us uh, to us from colonial time uh, because it was considered a person, a lady was unfit for marriage until she could spin yarn into material to make clothes. Also the word wife comes from, or the word wife comes from a word in another language that means to weave. So uh, making clothes was very important for a homemaker at that time. Uh, 
you might hear of people who wake up and they're not really with it at a time and they are said to be groggy. Well, the, food, the drink that was typically used by people as an alcohol in colonial times was called grog. And so if you drank too much of that, you also weren't in very good mind. And so that's how groggy comes about. Uh, the phrase chalk it up is actually chalking something up. And that would be making marks on the wall for someone who has had drinks and they will pay you for them in the future, but their word is good. And it's actually, if you chalk that up, then it's going to happen. And so they would make chalk marks on the wall, guaranteeing that drinks at a bar at a tavern would be paid for. Another phrase comes from the bars, and that is mind your P's and Q's. Sometimes people would get rowdy at the tavern, and the bartender would try to stop the, the feeling of we're gonna get a fight going on here by telling the patrons to mind your P's and Q's. Well, he was telling them to do what you came here for, mind your pints or quarts of whatever you were drinking. So P for pints and Q for quarts. And the last one I'm gonna tell you about this morning is powder room. And ladies, uh, you see this on TV all the time, I need to go to the powder room uh, instead of saying the bathroom or the restroom. Uh, the powder room was not the bathroom in colonial times. Uh, the bathroom in the colonial times was outside of course, but the powder room that they were going to was a place where they would add powder to their powdered wigs. And men as well as women would go to the powder room and try to improve the look of their wigs as they were um, there um, at a social event. Well, I hope that some of these words will have more meaning to you as people use them for you. And if you like one of these phrases, you'll know what it means and how to use it and when to use it. Uh, when my children were growing up, um, I didn't want them cussing, but I didn't want to give them a list of the words that they shouldn't say. So I told them, don't say a word unless you know what it means. So I've tried to give you some words and what they really, the root of them and what they stand for. And of course they've come down to us from colonial times. So with that being said, I hope you have a good afternoon and I would welcome any questions that you might have um, here in the next few minutes. So thanks a lot. Well, this has been great. Uh, thank you, such fascinating information. We can't thank you enough for coming here on PALS TV and sharing your vast amount of knowledge on such a wide variety of topics. Um, I'm a sports fanatic, so I've heard many of these sayings and never realized they came from the colonial times. So mm. each week I, I learned something new and fascinating here on your segments. and. If anyone would like to go back and watch some of the previous episodes Ed had, has given us here, um, and you were not on weeks one or two, you can go back to our website and under PALS TV, it's underneath our schedule, you can find those previous videos. So go check those out from Ed. He does a great job and we, we can't thank him enough for coming on here and, and sharing him, his insights with us. So thank you, Ed. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. My pleasure. So, okay, everyone. Well, taking a short break here. So go enjoy your lunch or get ready for your lunch hour. And we'll be coming back to you live from Columbus next. So again, we're thankful for Ed to come on here and <clears throat> teach us something new every single week. So always appreciate it. See ya. See everyone soon.